Rajan. Good evening. Oh. No, please, I'm going to make sure we're going. Our live is working. Okay, it is. Good. Um, Ajahn, thank you uh, for joining for the conversation, and thank you for having me join you for the conversation, and others, thanks for joining us. So welcome, everyone, to our Clear Mountain Wednesday um, conversation. And uh, just for a bit of context, um, if you're joining us, you can... uh, Tap, type into the chat any uh, questions you have or things you'd like to discuss later in the talk. Um, I think my image might be a little blurry. If that's the case, I apologize. Let us know if the audio is all right. Um, and today we wanted to begin with a conversation on uh, Buddhist uh, or what finding humility in conceit, Ajahn? Praise and blame. Finding yeah. humility in praise and blame. Yeah. So, um, you know, this has just been an interesting thing that's come up um, in terms of, uh, gosh, life in general, but really starting, um, you know, uh, being more in a public forum um, and trying to uh, figure out how to maintain a firm grounding in humility through that and just the forces of praise and blame uh, some people will be familiar with the eight worldly winds as they're called of praise blame fame disrepute gain loss pleasure pain and four of those eight um, have to do with this aspect about how we're viewed um, and just the intensity of that desire to be viewed correctly and the suffering that can come from not so we thought it was a really potent or um you know, useful thing to look into uh, in general. And, yeah, do you have anything else to say around it, Ajahn? Um, No, that's a a beautiful introduction. I mean, um, to especially to the praise and blame aspect of things, yeah, that's an interesting insight about those eight worldly wins. The other, um, so just to fill that out, for people who aren't familiar with the list, you have uh, pleasure and pain, you've got loss and gain, and then uh, the four as Tanisabo mentioned, which deal with this uh, this aspect of yeah our our public face and how other people perceive us are uh, praise and um, censure and then uh, fame and disrepute uh, in all of their shades um, and also just yeah it'll be great to talk more I, I really um, yeah look forward to this I in thinking about this conversation um, if a topic of you know the topic of humility. Um, talking about it with another monk or another practitioner, there's always this risk of like, you know, it kind of feels like a trap almost, like you're either going to implicate the other person, you're, you're almost like setting the other person up to, you know, be trapped into uh, praise or blame or committing that they're ultimately um, humble. So I, I was thinking that I would not use you in this conversation, but just talk about one. So just talk about your experience. Um, yeah. One's experience of praise and blame. And stuff. That's right. That's right. Good. Okay. Yeah. But specifically right. as you may have experienced it in your it, life. And you indeed. Can, you use as whatever one pronouns you want. Meaning myself. Good. <laughs> right. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, maybe I can just start in on some of the questions that I had. Um, so your monastic life, you started off in a different country. Than I did. I started off um, my deep dive into Buddhism and in a monastic form in America, whereas you did it in in Thailand. And I'm curious if you have any reflections on, um, yeah, how either the humility role models that you had in Thailand, or just, um, yeah, what what role um, humility in the face of praise and blame? How, how did that manifest as it was seen in, in Thailand. Um, yeah. mm. It kind of does implicate you, but um, yeah. It's fine. That's good. Okay. Um, yeah, the parsing out the monastic culture versus Thai culture is an interesting task because, as you know, Ajahn, they, um, you know, they really overlap a good deal. Um, but one of the qualities you really see exemplified in the 
Thai monastic um, scene is this uh, sort of thread of um, a dynamic of hierarchy, actually, and um, uh, this, this uh, discipleship, basically, of you know, and, and how much of this is Thai versus how much of this is in the actual vinya is an interesting question, although I don't think we have to go into it too much. But um, in the monastic code, the uh, monks and the nuns, um, you know, until their, for their first five years of full ordination are under what's called nisaya, which is dependence, um, which means you basically take on uh, a teacher um, who you have certain responsibilities to, washing their robe, uh, you know, taking care of all these little things. And, you know, this has been um, elucidated and detailed to, you know, there's just pages of how exactly you care for an uh, elder's robe and um, where, you know, in our tradition, like how you place their spittoon out, how you take their bowl in a beautiful fashion. It's um, a full-time job to really care in this beautiful way for a teacher, and then they have a duty to their student where they'll, you know, treat them a bit like a father would treat a child or a, you know, mother would treat a child where they care for their requisites and their training. And uh, you, if you leave a place before you've reached five years as a monastic, then when you come into contact with a new uh, teacher or situation, um, that's appropriate, you're expected to immediately take dependence again. You're always supposed to be in this role of, uh, of dependency, of nisaya. And it's pretty profound to see how it's held in Thailand, where there's just this um, utter humility and, um, you know, real giving of oneself. And some Thai monks I've met, and some Westerners, um, but just some Thai monks have been so astoundingly beautiful at this. Um, I lived with one Ajahn named Ajahn Anusit, who, you know, he just had such faith in uh, Longpur Nan. He said, you know, if Ajahn Anand tells me to ordain or to uh, work, I'll work. If he tells me to die, I'll die. If he tells me to do- give a Dhamma talk, I won't give a Dhamma talk. <laughs> he was like a very shy monk, but he just had like such, such love. I mean, it's a, a funny story, but... Um, yeah, and, uh, seeing, you know, really, you know, cause there are misunderstandings. Sometimes the teacher will come down on you for something you didn't do, or, you know, and there's this constant test of like, if you explain yourself too much or kind of try to justify, there's this immediate unbeautiful aspect, even if you're in the right. And to see again and again, like how in that dynamic, you can just be quiet and let the misunderstanding fall or let the kind of admonition wash over you and just be humbled by it and take it Mm. as a chance to learn. It's really impressive. And it's such a difficult task that having that vinya structure to kind of make it um, much more instantiated, it's helpful because it's, it takes a lot of effort to not to give in to blame or something like that. And the final thing I'll mention is, um, just that having those, when you're in a situation where you're serving as an assistant to, or a attendant to a senior monk who, you know, you don't find inspiring. Um, that's honestly one of the best opportunities for developing humility I've ever had. Um, and the, the sort of hierarchical systems useful in that sense too, is that even when the monastic you're caring for is not someone you, you know, are as inspired by that's just such a beautiful opportunity to really um, just say, look, you know, they went forth in this life before I did. This is a chance to develop humility, and so I'll embrace it. Um, yeah. What about mm. you, Ajahn, or any other thoughts? Um, no, that's that's beautiful, and I've had similar experiences with uh, you know just thinking of these like uh, yeah humble role models. I mean, um, yeah, certainly it's it's just there are just so many. And um, I feel like in America, certainly, uh, I had never lived in an institution, you know? I mean, a monastery, um, you know, is an institution of sorts. And uh, I'd never been a part of an institution where humility and actions of humility and bodily deportment, which, you know, conveys this, um, 
this lowering of oneself, which I think we can talk about one talk mm-hmm. about more. You know, like this humbling, this literally, you know, getting close closer to the earth. You know, um, of which there are many terms, both in English and in Pali, which have this show this correlance between, um, yeah, not being conceited and kind of a grounded a groundedness. Um, but yeah, just you know, maybe humility, you know, is a background virtue, but the kind of gestures of humility, the the actions of humility, and the kind of dance of um, yeah, showing deference, which uh, I found in America, um, largely modeled by monks who had lived in or spent time in Thailand. So, mm-hmm. um, and it is like you say, it's it's just beautiful, and it, it just warms the heart. And like, you know, there's a lot of um, maybe for people who haven't spent much time in Thailand or in these monasteries, or don't feel that they're they're safe spaces, or feel kind of put off by. Um, different aspects of monasticism um you know they might not you know just be able to tap in the to this uh the the beauty of of these gestures but um yeah i mean just for instance you know when you're walking in front of someone there's just so much more cognizance and social awareness of of everyone you know it must be cultural because you find it in like novices who ordained like yesterday like they just know how to like if you get in the proximity of someone you kind of lower yourself if you're walking in front of them if they're mm. talking to someone else and yeah this this kind of embodied uh yeah embodied lowering is is just mm. um yeah something which is it's unfortunate that we don't have more um more systems like that 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 teach that in in America I was thinking well our uh Ajahn Kobelo, I almost just called you long poor. <laughs> the level of humility we're talking about. But, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting having, um, you know, uh, it's, there's a funny experience when you come to a new monastery in Thailand where you'll meet like these monks and some of them might have been ordained for about two weeks, but every, but you don't know, like some of them have been ordained for 20 years and there's no way of figuring it out. And you learn very quickly that you always assume like a monk is like, has been in robes for 30 years and just you kind of not completely like you have to sort of navigate that but it's kind of a beautiful assumption and then you ask for forgiveness when you leave always a monastery and just it's this beautiful ethic of you know because from a sort of individualist perspective it's like i haven't done that much wrong like what's you know but to take it as this training and to see each person you encounter not as an individual but largely as a representative of the triple gem and and take it as that. And uh, Ajahn Kovilo, you're one of the... Oh, and just Longpur Pasno embodies this ethic better than almost any teacher I've ever met. And you just see him, you know, he'll be up there at the front leading a community and then someone slightly senior to him will come and he'll just click into this mode where he's like, Ajahn, you, you've experienced this plenty with him, you know, like bringing them cups of water and like asking what they would like to drink and pouring them juice and just... I remember when Longpur Liam came to visit Abayagiri, Longpur Pasano gave us all the monks this like strong talk on like how we shouldn't walk past Longpur Liam too close when he was sitting down, but like bend sort of 20 feet away and sort of keep a slight hum- humble bent bow to the head. And I'm curious, uh, do any of these ring a bell or bring up other oh. things for you? Oh, yeah. I mean, it doesn't just ring a bell. I mean, it rings like a whole like room full of bells, you know, it's like, it's just so obvious to see. It's like the water you swim in, basically, in a, in a Thai forest monastery. Yeah. Um, and just on the opposite end of that, I won't call out the meditation center. It wasn't a monastery, a meditation center in America where Lumpur Liam had been invited to go and teach. Um, this was several years ago. And just like the lack of awareness of um, kind of this uh, etiquette of respect and mindfulness, you know, he was up giving these teachings and there's like this couple like this, this man and this woman who are like right in the front row, like with their feet, just like during the break or something, they just decide to like <laughs> to lie down, you know, with their feet pointing towards <laughs> Lumpur Liam, which is just. And I think one woman actually like got up and like, you know, they're in monasteries. You've got like a, some napkins that some junior monk put next to you in case you want to wipe your nose or something. And this lay person in this retreat like goes up and like comes and takes one of Lumpur Liam's napkins or <laughs> tissues. And uh, it's just like, on one level, like, so what? 
you know, obviously, and Lumpur Liam certainly didn't make a problem out of it. I mean, that would never happen in Thailand, but who cares? I mean, like, on one level, yeah, I mean, these are all just, like, conventions, and we shouldn't, you know, expect this kind of thing, but it was just so noticeable, like, um, the lack of uh, social finesse um, mm. in, in, in relationship with, like, um, the, peop- the monks who had, even the junior monks who Lumpur Liam had brought with him, you know, who were just, they themselves would have been, you know, 20 years in robes, but, you know, they're the first ones to uh, get up and, you know, do anything they can for, for Lumpur Liam. One other thing in relationship to what you um, pointed out, like when you visit a monastery, it's kind of neat that you can't, you don't know who's very senior or very junior. And that kind of is like a mark, at least in my mind, Mm. of like a really well-trained monk is like they're not totally f- puffed up with air like the one of the thai words for humility is ni vata vata is like the air element and ni is like the prefix which just means down and out so it's like all of the air has just been let out of this uh this person and it's like they're no longer stuck up and mm. um yeah the fact that you can go to a monastery and you know see somebody who's just sweeping the grounds and you have no idea if they've been in ropes for 30 years, and even if we t- you talk to them, they don't kind of hold that over you. So I appreciate you yeah, highlighting that. No, I, I agree. And just the, you know, I think you're right. It can seem to kind of a modern American viewpoint about, like, why is this important? And it, I think it really comes down to that thing about, um, you know, I've said this before, but we understand that internal inclination affects external action. But what we've kind of forgotten as a culture is that external action really affects the heart. And um, you find that if you show, you know, for example, Dhamma books, you're supposed to keep in a high place, um, you know, not uh, near other books, like really distinguished. And you find when you begin to take these like small, on one level, it's like, who cares? You know, it's just where you're storing the books. But you find it affects how you relate to these things. And... Ajahn Kovil, I mean, I'm, I'd like to ask you about your practice of humility because you, um, I, apparently I'm supposed to say one, so I <laughs> call you out as too humble, but you, wear, you, you truly embody this quality really beautifully. And I remember uh, we were doing an interview with a senior teacher and um, you just were holding Anjali the whole time and you, and you just said, like, look, when I hold Anjali, I, I feel like the teachings can enter directly into my heart much more. And... How have you adjusted your, yeah, any, anything that that brings up or other things you'd like to talk about in this context? Well, yeah, I mean, as like a junior monk, it's kind of your job to be humble. Like basically you're not giving any teachings, you know, in the Thai forest tradition, Ajahn Cha tradition. Um, basically monks were not, you know, really giving Dhamma talks until we've been in robes for five or ten years, you know, uh, living in the monastery for seven plus years. Um, so it's kind of easy to be humble when, like, you're nobody, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and not that we're somebody now, but, like, um, yeah, we are, you know, starting uh, this bigger project, this monastery project. And, um, yeah, I, I think, again, like, having role models who do it really well and also but learning from the models that, are, that don't do it well you know, whether that's in a Buddhist context, a monastic context, or, you know, a worldly context, you know, someone who's just totally full of themselves, you know, it's, uh, and when that's us, you know, as well, you know, whether we're, you know, you can see the same kind of um, um, stance, both external and and internal, and be like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to go in that direction, but I do want to go in this other direction, and, you know, um, I've always been impressed. I once asked Lumpur Pasano, like, who is your humility role model or like who is the monk who embodies humility the most to you and pretty much um you know without missing a beat he's like pa payuto who's the the author of buddha dhamma and i think he could have been saying that because i was the one who asked um you know and i do have this scholarly bent um but i've definitely found that to be the case with pa payuto when i've met him he's just he's radiant he's radiant he's a som debt you know, which is like of the Thai ecclesi- ecclesiastical hierarchy. So both Thai society, you've got a king, um, and in the monastic system, you've got this, uh, a supreme patriarch, um, mm. the Sangha Raja, and you've got this body of kind of senior monks who've, 
um, are extremely senior, both in age and, you know, they've been in robes for 60, 70 years. Um, uh, and he's, so he's one of those, but he's just so humble. And he's like, he doesn't know me from Joe, you know, or Ajahn, whatever. But um, he's just so kind to me, so open, you know, willing to give, it seems like, infinite amount of his time, which I'm always impressed with. Um, and Bhikkhu Bodhi as well, an American example, when I visited him, so humble. And mm. I, I, I kind of think that some of that is like being like swimming in, in texts when you're like relating to and like reading and translating these geniuses from the past. You have something to compare yourself to like, okay, yeah, I'm taking Sanskrit a little bit. I've taken a year and a half two years of Sanskrit, but like, I can't speak Sanskrit. My Pali's okay, you know, compared to these people, you know, who are composing, you know, Leti Sayadaw, a Burmese monk, um, you know, 1900s, 1800s, um, Burma, you know, you could basically speak and write Pali. You know, you, you just see these examples, historical examples, which just kind of knock you down. It just doesn't make sense. Um, that's not to say that pride doesn't come up, which it does. Um, but that's just one you know, skillful means this historical compa- comparison. What, what else, what do you use? I mean, um, like sometimes praise can come so, so quickly. Um, and, you know, sometimes the ego can just be so quick to make the stupid decision to believe um, that you're all that in a bag of chips, as we say in Cincinnati. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, what, what, what do you use? What, what techniques work for you? There's a... Uh... A sutta I've been thinking about a lot um, called the Kinti Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 103, and it's like, it's not explicitly related to this, but it's it's the Buddha talking about how you resolve conflicts. And he says, like, look, if you go to these mendicants, you know, and say, you know, the venerable, the blessed one has said such argument is a hindrance to the holy life, and then they resolve the conflict, and then these other bhikkhus come to you and say, I... Uh, what did you do to solve the conflict between those other bhikkhus? You shouldn't say, yes, I went to those bhikkhus and I spoke to them, etc. Rather, you should say, uh, I went to them and I uh, spoke about the Dhamma. Having heard the Dhamma, they sort of practiced the Dhamma. Um, having practicing, you know, practicing the Dhamma, they came into alignment. And, and it takes you out of it and, and raises up the Dhamma. And there's another suit that we've talked about um, called like like the moon, um, I believe, the, in the Kasapa Samyutta. And I, I think Ajahn Kobe and I both use this regularly before Dhamma talks. Often when I'm bowing to the Buddha before a talk, I'll be reciting these lines um, where the Buddha says, like, if one appro- uh, approaches householders with the thoughts, may I teach them the, the Dhamma. Having heard the Dhamma, may they gain faith in me. Having gained faith in me, may they show their faith in me. Such a bhikkhu is not worthy to p- teach the Dhamma. Another bhikkhu approaches householders with the thought, the Dhamma is well expounded by the Blessed One, apparent here and now, timeless, leading inwards, etc. Um, may these people hear the Dhamma, having heard the Dhamma, may they practice the Dhamma correctly. Um, thus that bhikkhu teaches the Dhamma out of respect for the excellence of the Dhamma. And, you know, not only this, like, you know, that second bhikkhu's raising up of the Dhamma at the very beginning and like praising it in its full and then taking themselves out of the equation completely. I just find so beautiful. And, um, mm. you know, cause yeah, it's not, uh, you know, just bringing it back to the Dhamma. So if people come up and are like, that was a great talk, just saying, you know, this is, these are the suttas, like the Buddha's teaching is astounding. Um, we're just, you know, really, uh, sort of moving with this, the most um, profound teaching that's ever been given to humanity. Um, mm. and, and I find kind of constantly pointing things back to the source has been really helpful. And even with this project, you know, we've spoken about the right term for what we're occupying with regards to Clear Mountain, and Abbott always felt weird to both of us, but steward felt correct. Something like, we're trying to steward something good into being. and. So all that languaging's helped and, and really kind of raising up the Dhamma again. Mm. And I love that sutta. Um, yeah. So Ajahn, what, what about you? Thank you for that question. 
Yeah, no, thank you for that, those reflections. I mean, well, that's another thing, like gratitude just really helps for humility and genuine gratitude. I think you highlighting Kasapa, Maha Kasapa, is great. Uh, people should uh, read the Kasapa Sangyutta. I believe it's Sangyutta number 17. Um, but Maha Kasapa was the foremost in ascetic practices. So basically, he was like a monk, you know, Navy SEAL. He was like the Green Beret of like the ascetic wing of the Sasana. So he's like really hardcore and he's impressive. Um, but there's a teaching which is given to him. Um, let's see what it's called. I think it's called, yeah, the Chivara Sutta or the um, Sutta on Robes. So this is when he first meets the Buddha. And some places even say that this is how the Buddha gave Mahakasapa ordination, but basically told him, Mahakasapa, you should train like this, uh, and then gave him three admonitions, which I think are are really good to, they're all like countering um, conceit, and they relate to, so the first one is basically, when I hear the Dhamma being, being taught, I will lend ear and I will want to hear it. And um, there's you know, several synonyms, there's a whole constellation of other words that kind of fill that out, but basically, like, delighting in other people's dhammas, like, if you're in a conversation, like, um, yeah, and this isn't just about monks or senior monks, people, when we get in, interested in dhamma, like most people who are listening to this, you start talking about it with people, and, you know, it, it can be so easy for a certain type or a certain mindset to kind of, like, just be waiting, like, what I'm going to say next, and just forget to listen and be like, Actually, you know, my friend is like, you know, saying some profound things here. Can I, like, stop this egoic momentum, you know, into the future and just be like, you know, f- flip that around? So, like, wanting to lend ear to the Dhamma. The second one is like showing hearing. Oh, please. Oh, uh, I just, I was, no, no, you, it's, I was, I was trying to give an example of that thing, but in trying to give it, I almost gave an example of what not to do. So, continue, <laughs> and then I'll. Jump in. <laughs> okay. I, 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 was, I was just saying we, we'd figured out that the key to these conversations initially, we'd both approach them with like having our little points of things we wanted to talk about on the topic. And the switch we made in the past few weeks was phrasing all of the things we wanted to talk about as questions for the other person with this intent to culti- like just seeing how much beauty there was in like that ethic of listening. Mm. So in trying to bring that up, I interrupted you and therefore illustrated what not to do. But the spontaneity is appropriate at the same time, so continue. It is, it is appropriate and beautiful, and I get to hear the Dhamma. Um, so, uh, the second one is, yeah, about cultivating, you know, Mahakaspa, you should train thus. I will have hiri and otapa, or this conscience and fear of wrongdoing, towards Navaka, Majima, and Teras. So, this is new monks to monks who've been around for a little bit, and to monks who are, are senior monks. You should be humble towards all of them, and, uh, yeah, in a hierarchical system with humans, you know, you do see this people who kind of are a tendency, and it it's ugly if I ever see it in myself, but it's um, it's ugly wherever it comes up, I like to, to lord over, you know, some ridiculous, I mean, the Buddha's teaching is not self, you know, to kind of lord yourself over because of some silly uh, hierarchy is ridiculous. And the last one is just to not relinquish. Um, Mahagasapa, you should train thus. Uh, I will not relinquish mindfulness of the body that is connected with joy. Mm. And uh, I feel like that is a fascinating listening exercise. And Tanispa, you and I should just have like a conversation on listening. I mean, it might devolve into just being totally quiet. But um, I, I feel like, yeah, like wanting to listen and like, can I listen with, you know, a body that's connected with joy and not relinquish that and... And if I can, then why do I even need to say what I want to say? You know, just... Thank you, Ajahn. What are your thoughts? Do you... I mean, we're getting close time to talk with others, but I know you... I think you were the one who created our shared note for that sutta, so I know you uh, like it. But I don't know if you've had any insights on that or, or otherwise. We had a bunch of things we might want to talk about, and we've only touched on a portion, so... Thank you, Ajahn. I, I uh, don't want to say much. I, I like the idea of going to questions and listening to, to them. Um, but I just, um, gosh, if I was to add anything onto that, I, I just think that I'd never associated the, that third point in the Chivara Sutta with the, 
listening and humility. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful association because so often what makes you not listen is that feeling of lack of pasadi and settledness in the body, like feeling like you've got to move or, or release pressure. And if there is that sense of being able to just wait, wait, you know, it just gives you this ability to just... Because, yeah, I mean, you've got, you got talkative monks out there, you know. I, we've both been around, you know, and, and you've got talkative non-monks. And uh, it's just beautiful to be able to navigate that with real Brahma Vihara and real patience. And um, that grounding in the body, that's a brilliant um, thing. I hadn't thought of that. So thank you, Ajahn. Uh, do you mind if I look at some of the questions, Ajahn? Yeah, please. Um, so if people want to type in stuff that they'd uh, like to talk about or any questions they have. Um, and I'm sorry I'm out of focus, I know. Uh, we've been trying for months to figure out the right platform, but this one will let us upload a high-quality version later, so maybe that's worth something. Um, Sandra asks, as someone who has no knowledge of proper etiquette, etiquette, etiquette around Ajans, how can I learn? Can you provide a cheat sheet? I'd like to honor you both in the traditional ways. Ajahn? Wow, I think um, Ajahn, there was a, a book called a, the Core Wat Manual that was put out a number of years ago, which I think is, you know, goes pretty explicit on a number of these things. And, and I agree, it is nice to have things written out. Um, maybe I'll see if I can find a link to that and uh, excerpt some and share it to our Discord server. Um, do you know of any resources, Tom Nisimbo, either? Yeah, I'm going to paste something into the chat of the YouTube right now. Um, it's a uh, it's called the Bhikkhu's Rules: A Guide for Lay People. Mm. It's it's like it's not a cheat sheet. It's quite long. I'm sorry, uh, but yeah, just if you ever ask us, the monks aren't offended, so we're happy to talk about that. And it's so beautiful when a community can come together um, and show that, especially to a senior visiting monastic of some kind. Um, you know, like, just, for example, knowing to, whenever you leave a monastery, to ask for forgiveness. And I do this in almost all contexts now. Like, once my parents and I have spent time together, we'll ask for forgiveness of each other. Um, yeah, I just think, you know, the Dhamma, the Buddha taught the Dhamma Vinaya, and we love the Dhamma. And there's so many, the Vinaya is less romantic to talk about, including these, like, you know, day-to-day -day, uh admonitions about how to act, but there's such beauty hidden in them, and they're very wonderful to sort of draw out the marrow of... Um, any other thoughts, Ajahn, or should we go to another question? Um, yeah, just, I mean, Vinaya being the monastic rules, and um, yeah, maybe we can go to uh, another question. Uh, Andrew asks, what is the name of the author that starts with a P again? Paiuto. P -A -Y -U -T TTO is how it's spelled in English. And you can find, if you search for Buddha Dhamma, all one word, Paiuto, and then I think you might have to type github.io. Oh, I'll paste it in. Nice. Right Thank well. you. Yeah. Thank you. It's not so easy to find, actually, on the web. The, um, you know, and one interesting thing about P.A. Paiuto, Venerable P.A. Paiuto, that Ajahn Kovelo was mentioning is his, yeah, his humility. And when I was with Ajahn Jayasaro, um, then P.A. Piyuto had an uh, appointment in Japan to get treated for cancer. And they're trying to schedule it and like figure out how to get him there. And his, his biggest concern for scheduling was that he didn't want it to be during the week of his assistant's... Like he had an assistant who'd been ordained a, a few years. His assistant's poly exam, he didn't want it to interfere at all with their poly exam um, when he went to get his surgery. And it was just the most beautiful consideration of... You know, just this level of humility in that act and that way of thinking was astounding. Mm. Yeah, just on on him, I mean, his... So we mentioned that he's got an ecclesiastical title. And these ecclesiastical titles can be pretty, like, you know, it could go to someone's head very easily. You get new names each time you get a higher title. So I was trying to find it right now, couldn't find it. But P.A. Paiuto is just what Americans and Europeans call him. I mean, his full title is Tan, which is like a venerable, you know, means venerable, Somdet, which means like the venerable, refulgent 
um, and I'm probably not even on the level that he's at right now, but pra, uh, prom kunapo, and uh, yeah, I think he's even a higher level than that. But pra means excellent, um, prom means like the Brahma god, uh, kun <laughs> means like the excellent virtue, um, pawn is like a blessing. So his name is basically uh, the most <laughs> excellent god on high who, um, you know, is a blessing of virtues. So. But he holds it, um, yeah, totally down to earth. So, thank you, Ajahn. Um, before we go to, I'm going to skip ahead on one of the questions um, because it relates quickly. Karuna asks, when you say that when you leave a monastery or home, you ask for forgiveness, what are you asking forgiveness for? Ajahn Kovilo, do you want to answer that? Um, how about how about you do? Because I've never done it with my family. Which is an interesting twist. Yeah, the um, you basically the uh, ritual and the um, sort of the phrasing we use is sort of my body, speech, or mind for anything I've done. I ask for forgiveness, and then the uh, senior monk says, "I forgive you," and then they ask forgiveness of you um, for anything I've done, and then so it's this beautiful exchange. My sense really is uh, it's just a chance to acknowledge when you leave uh, another that often we haven't comported ourselves perfectly. Um, and there's always, you know, it's also an acknowledgement there's always room to act more beautifully. Um, and, and more than that, it's, it's sort of a way of instantiating in a relationship and in a moment that ethic of humility and... Um, really accepting on ourselves the intention to to grow and become more beautiful. I mean, it doesn't matter if you don't exactly recall what it is. It's a nice sort of blanket statement. Luckily, um, well, or unluckily, I suppose, it, it, it tends to apply when I've been with my parents. I, you know, like, like most children, I, I slip up every now and again. And, you know, usually when I ask for forgiveness, there is a, there's something I can think of. And I'll often bring that up in a more intimate setting with the person, but not with a senior teacher um, sometimes, unless I have a separate conversation. Right. Um, and the reason why it isn't super weird with your parents is because they're Buddhist, so... Yes, yeah. uh, that is... It might be weirder if they weren't. Yes. yes. <laughs> My mom and dad would think that was totally... Yeah, totally Thank cult. You. I mean, I've been you know, doing a lot to convince I'm not in a cult for the last 15 years, but um, <laughs> that might flip their perception, so... Ajahn, I have heard that there are two kinds of teachings, active and passive teaching. Can you explain this? Yeah, I mean, just in the context of, um, uh, of humility, that's, that's an interesting distinction. I, I'd be curious, maybe you could just put where you have heard that from, because it's not actually a, a format that you find so explicitly uh, held up all over the place in... Um, Theravada Buddhism, but certainly in terms of like virtues, like you have the the actions of humility. I mean, right now we're giving a talk, you know, we're talking about humility, and um, but then you've got the the passive expressions of it, like the monks who don't say a word, um, the people, the people. Forget about monks. Most people, most of you don't live in a monastery, but just the people who just kind of mm. blend into the background and don't blend into the background because they're afraid or because they don't have anything to say, but because they just don't feel the need to put themselves first. And just like that, um, yeah, maybe this is in the context of passive versus active teaching. Um, I think that this concept of passive and active uh, practices um, could, yeah, be ex expanded a lot more. I mean, in terms of, you know, the activeness of speaking versus the passiveness of of mm -hmm. listening. I'm currently at the university that I'm at. We're having a Guanyin retreat. So um, the Chinese name Guanyin or Guanyin Pusa literally means um, she's the name of the, the goddess of Lokiteshvara, the one who hears the sounds of the world. So basically it's been a, um, yeah, a listening practice, a lot of reciting, but basically reciting so as to be able to listen. Um, what do you think about that, Tanispa? The, the active versus passive, is that something that you think about? Yeah. 
Uh, it reminds me of a quote. Um, I didn't go to the rabbi to hear him teach. I went to see how he tied his shoes, you know. Um, <laughs> and one of the beauties of having a form, um, well, yeah, just seeing that sort of passive, I mean, this, I don't know if this is exactly what they're speaking about, and if we had more time, we could go into it, and maybe on Zoom, but certainly, you know, for me, that active element of teaching or something versus a passive element of how you comport yourself day to day, um, uh, that's an interesting paradigm to think about, and that quiet way of, of teaching, which is so powerful. Um, so that that is interesting for me. And how sort of the passive forms work on us, um, you know, e- even, for example, the way we're wearing our robes now, that having the right shoulder bared is a way in the Buddhist times of showing respect for um, when you're in the presence of a Buddha image in a safe, holy place, you bare your right shoulder to, uh, you know, the right arm was sort of the, the clean arm and, and you just show it vulnerable. And it's, it's an, an act of humility or it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be a reminder so it's sort of this passive element of the vinya and the teaching and the form, which all these little props, you know, the props matter. Um, so those, just a thought, um, Ajahn, and props. I would go, I would go on, but I actually think there's one really interesting question I'd love to get to before uh, we finish up. Um, the question, which sutta is your all-time favorite in the Majjhima Nikaya? Ajahn, that is a cool that is a cool question, and you should ask all your friends, because I imagine most of them will say something different. Um, I'm going to have to say Sabhasava Sutta, uh, in Nikaya number two. So, yeah, in my mind, if you're reading the Majjhima Nikaya, you can just skip Majjhima Nikaya number one and just go to number two. But, um, yeah. We'll come back spot. to number one later, definitely. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Did you, in yourself? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a hard... I mean, there's so many different ones. Um... One of the ones that's overlooked, I think, is uh, Majjhima Nikaya 30, um, 38, the Maha Hatipadopa Ma Sutta. Um, is that 38, I think? 28, I think. 28, yeah. yeah. Where it's this brilliant, you know, the teaching's holographic in a sense, where you go into one part and it opens up into all the rest of the teaching, and then you go in there and it goes all the rest. And so it's Venerable Sariputta saying, just as the footprints of all animals fits in the footprint of the elephant, even so all teachings fit in the Four Noble Truths. And then he goes into the First Noble Truth, and he says, you know, the First Noble Truth of suffering, which is attachment to the five khandas, and then he burrows through that into the earth element, and then he burrows through that into how you use the earth element to develop this passion towards the body, and he burrows through that to think about how you use that to develop loving kindness and equanimity and faith, and he like... He shows how it's this continually opening horizon through every single aspect of the teaching. It's overlooked and it's profound. So I love that one. And I think we just hit 6.45 p.m. Good answer. You too, Ajahn. (laughs) All right. So um, we're going to post the link to the Zoom um, into the YouTube chat. And those who want to join us there um, will be... Uh, speaking from 6.45 to 7.30. If you, for whatever reason, can't see the uh, link, just go to Clear Mountain's YouTube page and go halfway down. And um, Ajahn, it's a pleasure to talk to you today, and thank you. You too, Venable. And yeah, we'll just jump over to Zoom, and hope everybody has a good weekend, and you can go and see Tanisimo in person on Saturday at St. Mark's. So.